Thank you very much, Dr. Rajesh, for that exciting introduction, not only on knowledge democracy, but highlighting the four approaches of social responsibility in education as reflected by the samples from the book. Thank you so much. So without <clears throat> further ado, let's welcome uh, Professor Dr. Eileen, our panelist, to, to share her thoughts on transformative knowledge. Thank you. Over to you, Dr. Eileen. Okay. Um, thank you, Dr. Muzaimi. A very good day to all participants, ladies and gentlemen. I wish to thank the organizer and it's, it is a great honor to be given an opportunity to share my thoughts with, besides the two giant experts in the field of knowledge democracy. Now let me share my screen. Huh? All right. Okay, I would like to talk, um, today I would like to talk about transformative knowledge and the changes required to drive social change. Transformative knowledge is about creating and using knowledge for transition goes beyond simple theory building because that is what we usually do in the ivory tower. We focus a lot on uh, theory building. Uh, therefore, uh, transformative knowledge is about creating and using knowledge uh, for transition uh, that involve simple theory building knowledge that contributes to fundamental irreversible change and that generates sustainable future. Transformative knowledge is knowledge that is systemic, critical, generative, and reflective with both societal and scientific impact. A lot of times in the olden days, uh, we just focus on scientific impact and scientific innovation. But now, like what Dr. Rajesh has mentioned, we need to incorporate in the societal impact as well to make a difference to the society as in the whole. Transformative knowledge is knowledge that transform yeah, ourselves, our organizations, and the society. Transformative knowledge and learning involves experiencing a deep structural shift in the basic premises of thought, feelings, and action. It used to be knowledge, it used to be just focusing on thoughts. It does not involve feelings and ourselves. So the, the transformative knowledge now incorporates all these things together. It is a shift of consciousness that dramatically and permanently alters our way of being in the world. You know, we are no longer in a, a, a built wall, like what Dr. Rajesh has mentioned, built wall around the ivory tower. We are now open up uh, to be being in the world. Such a shift involves our understanding of ourselves and our self-locations, our relationships with other humans and with the natural world. You know, because I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a biologist, you know, a lot of times, uh, basic scientific uh, biology uh, uh, causes involve a, a biotic component and a biotic component. That is why even for knowledge as a whole, we do have to inc incorporate in um, the interactions, yeah, understanding of ourselves and our location, our self-location, um, our relationship with other humans and with the natural world. Our understanding of relations of power in interlocking structures of class, race, and gender. Our vision of alternative approaches to living. Yeah, I mean, um, uh, it's to we have uh, options, you know. For those which education, you know, in the current scenario, we do have options. But for those uneducated and, and underprivileged, do they have the options? Through transformative knowledge, we can create alternative approaches and options to living and our sense of possibilities for social justice, peace, and personal joy. This slide shows an overview of the framework of transformative knowledge that incorporates goals of transformation, worldviews, human relationship with each other, 
human relationship with nature and strategies to achieve transformation. In order to address the challenges of knowledge and moving towards impactful and successful transformative knowledge, we need to adapt ourselves to being knowledge, knowledge justic. You know, um, this morning I was I was searching um, Google. You know, asking Doctor Professor Google. You know, how do I pronounce the word knowledge stick? You know, what came up was this word is not being captured or, or not found in, in in the search. You know, this is fairly a new word. So I'm I'm going to talk about this new word as well as the new approaches. There are several changes or shifts that need to be adapted towards being knowledge justic. Yeah, so this is the word. If you Google this, that's um, um, this is not word not in, in the in the system yet. Uh, in the Google dictionary, but there is such a word. So being knowledge stick is to show enthusiasm about and actively encourage the co-creation of transformative knowledge. Yeah, I'll explain more about what do we mean by co-creation of transformative knowledge on the later slides. And I've been knowledge just also, it implies actively incorporating changes in the way we handle, use, build and understand knowledge. Like what uh, 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 Dr. Rajesh has mentioned earlier, why must our syllabus, why must our, our um, uh, 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 education, our books, our school books, incorporating issues in, uh, in other, other countries rather than talking about the local scenario or sharing the indigenous knowledge in our education system. So those are the things we need to know. And then we must move on. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the changes that we must incorporate or we must uh, adapt ourselves to is to be knowledge stick in order for us to be able um, uh, to transform, uh, to, to, to adapt transformation knowledge. One of the changes is we must move on from considering that one criteria of truth and validity of knowledge are found in science, in the sense that other knowledge is considered non-existent or ir irrelevant and assuming that any knowledge is incomplete. You know, because a lot of time when we do science, when we do our research, our experiment, it is always monoculture. We're just talking, you know, the picture down that I'm showing is a reflection on what monoculture is, you know, like we just want to focus on planting the, the corn, where else we must consider Consider the whole ecosystem to make the plantation successful. Binologistic makes needs a shift from monoculture scientific knowledge to an ecology of knowledge. Therefore, ecology of knowledge, recognizing the plurality of knowledges, not only single knowledge, but plural. That means must be a combination of many knowledges and establishes the necessary theory of knowledge between the different sources of knowledge, which, which must be complementary. Yeah? We, um, like in science, you know, when we talk about ecology, we must incorporate in both the abiotic, the non-living components, as well as the living component into understanding an issue uh, uh, more completely. It is necessary to consider other plants in the garden, yeah, uh, in Batu Kamo, other plants in the garden, since with them and with the cultivation, the universe is better, like what been shown um, um, in, in, in the diagram, you know, it's, it's just a thematic uh, representative. It is about also valuing all our indigenous uh, ancestral heritage and knowledge and placing it in an equal position, an equal position with other sources of knowledge. Because here in, for transformation knowledge, we need to put in the importance of indigenous knowledge as, as high priority as the science, the new knowledge that we are generating from time to time. And traditionally, uh, rational knowledge has been considered to be of a higher order, you know, as long as uh, a lot of time um, we go through our analysis, our thinking is through rational thinking. We put in 
the inputs, the opinions of people, facts, and then we process it. And then we expect to get the sound conclusion. Yeah, But the value of feelings, emotions, and affection has been expelled from the rational discourse. Therefore, being knowledgeistic in order to do transformation knowledge means knowledge must be considered as an equilibrium and a mixture of different human ways of knowing and capturing reality that includes intuitive, experiential, and emotional knowledge and reasons. Yeah? You have to go through by experience and by discussion, communication, to have to create the comprehensive knowledge. Knowledge should be comprehensive and also should seek a balance between personal aspects, such as values, affection and cognitive learning, rationality and intuition, the object and the subject, and the material and the spiritual, the and the collective aspects, such as economics and eco ecology, present and the future, past, uh, sorry, past, present and the future, local and global, individual and community. You know, it's, it's a whole package. It has to be comprehensive. Um, uh, that's where transformative knowledge can happen. And also, in order for transformative knowledge to happen, we have to move from descriptive knowledge to knowledge for intervention. The creation of knowledge needs not only to describe or descriptive knowledge. A lot of time, you know, when we educate, when we teach our students in the classroom, describe, define, you know, we use these other terms we use for our, to guide our students, you know, but it has to go beyond that now. But also because now we have to move in terms also to prioritize its capacity of transformation, taking into account the context of phenomena and acquiring a problem solving perspective and the creation of alternative futures. A shift of, to, of knowledge for intervention the knowledge must be strong, must be firm, so we can make decisions, we may make these uh, changes and suggestions. Thus, knowledge has to integrate a scala variable in all forms. It can be in local, national, regional, global, and so on. And in all its interrelationships, and it must also incorporate the time variable in the different form, circular time, clean, uh, cyc uh, cyclinal time, and so on. And all have to be put into one whole big picture as a knowledge transformation, which can be used for intervention. In terms of social change, Action and intervention are as important as cognitive and rationality in the knowledge creation process. Therefore, transformative knowledge is to be guided by ethical criteria, especially regarding technologies, uh, applications, and repercussions arising from the impact. It is about also about including ethics attached to precaution. The common practice is usually on partial knowledge, yeah, where attention and focus is either from the inside perspective of or from the outside view. Um, uh, like what we mentioned, uh, you know, a lot of time we build walls yeah, around the ivory tower and we see things only within, from either from inside or from outside. You know, we don't incorporate in the whole environment. A lot of time, what is being generated is actually the partial knowledge. It is not holistic and complex. Therefore, you know, we have to move, we have to change in order to um, uh, adopt a, a, a impactful transformative knowledge. We have to change from partial knowledge to holistic and complex knowledge. Um, being knowledgeistic means to change from partial knowledge to holistic and complex knowledge and must integrate its humanistic and technological orientations and must have multiple perspectives and be built upon cross-disciplinary basis and complexity. Now, the common term is multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary, interdisciplinary, and, 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 and uh, so on and so forth. It's a mixture, you know, there's no longer about one knowledge and one display. 
knowledge is seen as being in the hands of a monopoly of expert knowledge producers. For example, you know, if I'm a marine biologist, you know, I only focus on marine system. I do not incorporate in, uh, for example, what causes uh, algae bloom. I only focus on what is happening in the ocean. I forgot about uh, what is happening globally in terms of climate change, what actually triggers uh, uh, the bloom, you know, those things, it has, it has to be um, um, uh, incorporated in as a whole thing. Um, so knowledge is seen as being in the hands of a monopoly of expert knowledge producers who exercise power over others through the expertise. An indication of isolated creation of knowledge, very isolated scenario, very isolated issues. Power relationship affect both those who participate and those whose knowledge counts, as well as how knowledge is socialized and used. The current polycentric production of knowledge must consider the universities, the new centers of expertise, as well as all agents that can and want to be involved in hybrid, horizontal, and cooperative spaces of reflection and action with the purpose of co-creation, the, need, the needed knowledge in each situation. This view of knowledge move from knowledge that is privately produced and for private consumption to a commitment to the socialization of knowledge for the common public good. The current emphasis in knowledge production and consumption is based on the assumption that knowledge is a commodity. In contrast, the knowledge commons will informs the significance of social control over the production and utilization of knowledge. In such a shift, commitment to knowledge as a contribution to the common public good may transform meanings and practice in the public sphere. Be knowledgeistic also, yeah, there should be a change yeah, from, from conceiving a static use of knowledge to a dynamic uh, and creative knowledge. This can be achieved quite easily and readily in today's world. For example, today, information and communication technologies, the so-called social web, enable us to assess and share information and knowledge and to interact and collaborate with others easily and instantly through communicate communities with the same interests, while at the same time contributing to enhance sociability. This scenario presents a total re revolution of foreknowledge. The chaotic interaction allows different ideas and types of knowledge to be brought into contact. It results in multiple combination or mutation that favor creativity and innovation. The process of knowledge creation, knowledge management and validity are short in time and their evolution is unpredictable. I believe that the change to be knowledge we can build transformative knowledge to drive social change. With that, I, I pause here for a while. I hand back the floor to Dr. Muzaimi. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Arlene, for the important message on knowledge If I get that pronunciation correct, many of which yeah. reflect the, the, the name transformative shifting of various uh, aspects of knowledge. And in that note, uh, we invite Dr. Munira as our third panelist to talk about how to liberate the captive mind, perhaps, if that's the wrong way of looking at things. Okay, Dr. Munira, over to you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. I'll uh, share screen now. Thank you, uh, Mozaimi, uh, for the uh, introduction and as well as for contacting me initially. Um, it was uh, very kind of you to include me in this uh, seminar. Now, I am um, going to take a slightly different angle, although the contents of my presentation um, cover a little bit of the two previous um, panelists um, uh, content. Now, as you can see, I have the word crisis in my <laughs> title uh, because that's exactly what I'm focusing on. And um, I will be speaking about 
why we are in a higher education crisis, uh, specifically, specifically with relationship to Malaysia's higher education. Um, so why we are in a crisis. And this has a lot to do with uh, leadership attitudes that mirror colonial administrative practices uh, prior to 1957. And it also, this, these, uh, that, that past colonial scenario highlights forms of power and control, which are manifest in our current higher education structure. Now, um, Mr. Minera, sorry, uh, I think your slide is not in a you are not mode. able to you're not able to see it um, we see but it's not in the full mode you know the display mode i see um slideshow sorry the slideshow format thanks are you able to see it now in full not quite okay, it's still uh, in the slide list <laughs> not a slideshow all right, how do I do this? I'm sorry for the participants, please bear with me. It, it's okay. Uh, we, we can see it the way it is, but because it's not moving, because it's not a large slideshow, you may want to navigate your slide uh, one by one then as, as you move from points to points. Okay. Um, I think it's much just, system uh, with that. Hmm. May I just stop the slide share for a while and get right. back? All right. Can, can. Uh, good. Thank you. Um, okay. Now, um, see what I mean by when I warned you, I might mess this up. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> Happened to me I all shall, the time too. I will call up the screen share again, but uh, it may problem may still persist. Um, uh, Dr. Mo uh, Monira, um, yes. on your slide, you ah, can, ah, yeah, yeah, no, you, you no, got no, it no, already, yeah. No, okay, <laughs> all right, okay, uh, everyone, awesome. please forgive me for that. Um, okay, let me get back into this, um, uh, what I was saying about the crisis. Now, the crisis, first of all, is the crisis, our crisis in knowledge democracy um, in Malaysia. And this dates back to um, how our pre-colonial system was constructed uh, in terms of the interaction between colonial um, administrators and the native population. In colonial Malaya, uh, practically there was no contact between native communities and the foreigners, uh, the colonial masters, so to speak, as well as with the outside world. In Southeast Asia, European colonial powers choked, controlled, and redirected the region's trade, destroying previously established activities. Before the British ar alive, arrived and uh, all the other colonial powers, the, the Portuguese, the Dutch, um, Southeast Asia was a very vibrant region, having contacts with uh, many parts of the, of the world. Um, including the Middle East, Europe, Latin America as well. But when the British arrived, all that was stopped because it was monopolized by the colonial powers themselves. The colonial powers established a socio-economic structure which excluded and marginalized the colonized. Oh, now... Um, I am not able to proceed with the okay thank you now the captive mind and higher education the captive mind um, is a phenomenon that was originated uh, by Said Hussein Alatas a Malaysian sociologist in 1972 he had published an article um, although previous to 1972 he had been talking about it uh, as part of his several critiques of colonialism. And in this um, concept, he, he brought up or he described the way current Malaysian um, society, specifically among the elite leadership uh, had developed. 
and this was um, this consisted of imitative thinking in research, planning, and development. It was uh, the mind, the captive mind is dominated by Western thought in an uncritical manner. Uh, and the psychological dimension, um, scholarship that emerged from the West, apparently, according to the captive mind, Western scholarship is superior to what we can produce. Um, part of this um, acknowledgement of superiority of the West is also about compartmentalizing knowledge, thinking in silos, the inability to venture out into native um, sources of knowledge and knowledge production, always uh, thinking about the West as supplying us with that. Um, another problem that we are beginning to see increasingly is substituting the arts and the humanities for a market-driven um, discipline. Continuing from this, uh, there's a lack of mastery of Western thought in our society, uh, yet we critique Western knowledge. There are, there's a group of scholars uh, in many universities in the country who are fond of critiquing and criticizing Western knowledge uh, for instance, the haphazard calls for to decolonize knowledge and universities. But in my uh, opinion, although these are welcome criti uh, critiques, uh, they are still superficial. In the Malaysian context, we have not uh, gone beyond merely criticizing the West because of the problem of the fact that we have not mastered Western thought. Um, Another issue that our universities are falling short of uh, is the scholars are actually incapable of raising original problems. Um, applying Western theories is insufficient to analyze indigenous problems. Now, an example, a good example of that is when international relations scholars analyze the conflict situation in the South China Sea. We use Western concepts of power, anarchy, uh, diplomacy, or even threat. So what is a threat to a Western theorist uh, looking in on our region is not treated as a threat, threat by us in the region. Although even though it may be treated as a threat, we articulate the problem differently. That brings a lot of misunderstanding between big powers vis-a-vis -vis smaller powers in the region. Um, many of our foreign policy or diplomatic moves are considered uh, weak or that we don't understand um, geopolitics or foreign policy. So this generates conflict situation and uh, a lot of uneasiness between the regions and between the cultures. Finally, there's also a preference for generalizations resulting in false perceptions of reality. Part of the captive mind uh, phenomenon uh, is a result of this phenomenon of uh, colonial capitalism, which is essentially control of and access to capital. Colonizers, the British in our case, did not want natives to be an obstacle to economic activities. They were subdued for the sake of advancing their own, the, coloni the colonial powers economic interests. In order to keep them in check, the British depicted natives as unintelligent, lazy, indolent, evil, unfit to rule. Uh, the, this was a deliberate attempt to break uh, their spirit. To, de to make them feel inferior, to dehumanize them. There are a few um, 19th and early 20th century scholars who have uh, focused on this. And when I say scholars, I mean from the global South. Uh, for instance, Said Hussein Alatas, he, he wrote the, uh, a very well received uh, book, The Myth of the Ra Lazy Native. Jose Rizal, who wrote uh, about the Philippines and the Spanish. Franz Fanon wrote about the French in Algeria. Raden Ajeng Kartini wrote about the Dutch. 
um, reform, uh, her reform uh, writings uh, against Dutch colonialism. And of course, uh, Jamaluddin al Afghani and Tagore. So these are scholars you, you know who have uh, reached um, fine and detailed analysis about the current state of underdevelopment in our societies, but yet they are not highlighted in the courses that we teach, not highlighted as much as uh, Western uh, writers. Um, now, what's the connection of um, what the previous slide with um, our current situation today? And this is the neo-colonial capitalism uh, and a new development or a new scenario of coloniality without colonialism. So coloniality without colonialism, it's the captive mind phenomenon is captured in this idea of colonial capitalism. Essentially, it's the control of knowledge production and access to knowledge, moral and artistic resources by our leadership or a dominant group in society. So what used to be the colonial British colonial masters has now mirrored into a current situation of our own native indigenous leadership group. Um, we have examples. I think it's, it's very, um, we are very knowledgeable of how history has been altered. The facts of history have been altered to control political narratives in order to enhance um, the ambitions of certain groups in society. For instance, our politicians, corporate leaders with links to government, access to scholarship, research funds. So this is the method of control. Um, what we learn, how we get access to the knowledge that is produced uh, is carefully uh, decided or, or not so obviously decided, but there are political motives behind it, uh, which is the same socioeconomic motives that the British used to do. Um, now, how do I connect all of this? Uh, what is the impact on the university? Um, my background is social science, specifically sociology, history, and political science. Um, and teaching social science disciplines with concepts that originate from the West. Uh, but we do that with fervor, but there is an absence of contextualizing it with our current situation. Uh, hence, you get in academic conferences, you get many uh, scholars, local scholars, who uh, are good at talking theory, which is what uh, Prof. Eileen, you mentioned about um, theory and being in your Ivy League box or building or wall. Uh, this is what we do. And uh, part of the reason is because we have been taught and captured mentally that quoting Western theories is a good thing. It raises our standard of scholarship. But in actuality, uh, it is the wrong approach because there is no fallout or continuance to how it influences development and how it is contextualized within our society. I think I mentioned earlier about um, the field of IR. Um, we teach realism, sovereignty, state, security, wars. Uh, there's a typo there. Um, wars and diplomacy in IR. But we do this by accepting the premise that the world is on a trajectory moving towards an international society. Who defines what is international? Uh, for that matter, who defines what is, um, what sort of diplomacy we use? You know, in uh, last month, I, when the foreign minister had uh, made a faux pas, supposedly it's a faux pas, I, I also thought it was, but there's an explanation behind it. The faux pas about calling China big brother, the Western press uh, really laughed at us and um, reduced us to pulp, saying that we know nothing about foreign policy. Uh, we are uh, under the thumb of China. But in actuality, this method, I'm not saying that it was the right thing for our foreign minister to do or to say, 
But in actuality, this method of diplomacy uh, dates back to the Sajarah Melayu. There are stories behind how the Raja of Malacca had um, um, subordinated himself to the emperor of China, but it was not perceived as being subservient. It was a style. Um, I've written an article about this. I, I'm hoping it will come out in about a, a month or two in which I introduce another term. Uh, and many in Malaysia will, will probably smile about this concept that I've introduced, but yes, not, I've introduced the term Kangkong diplomacy. I know it equates with the Kangkong professor that we are very used to hearing, uh, but the meaning behind this term is to dispel the notion that our style of diplomacy is subservient to another power. But I'm using and applying a story from the Sajarah Melayu that implies, um, that uses the symbol of a kangkong bending towards a super, uh, a, a, a bigger power, but at the same time managed, managing to stand up um, inequality. But I won't uh, go into more detail about that. Um, the image projected in Western IR theorizing is that the main actor in this movement to an international society is the um, US and Europe. Scholarly, dis scholarly discourses promote concepts such as core and periphery, uh, meaning the international relations discipline itself was established on the very notion of othering. There is a, already a, an established fundamental binary division of the world and of world order, where the core is the main actor and the periphery is expected to join or support the system. So there's no room for um, subaltern studies to fit in with international relations. Now, the situation I, I've uh, just discussed um, has resulted in a gradual decline in scholarship uh, in, in the country. Um, there is an absence of new concepts to reflect reality on the, on the ground, which goes back to my Hong Kong diplomacy earlier statement. Um, an absence of new concepts. Another problem that we are very familiar with is the politicization of the university. We are obsessed with policy relevant research, um, but I think we have uh, tipped the balance and now research has led to a lack of critical thinking. We are very concerned, especially the five RUs, very concerned with policy relevant research but I think the balance is, it's imbalanced because we are not taught to do creative research or analytical research as well, or we are not encouraged. Now, the fourth point is a big sore point in many parts of the global South, uh, throughout Latin America, um, the continent of Africa and in our region is this obsession with the global university ranking exercises. Um, a big problem in Malaysia's university system in higher education, public and private, is also academic dishonesty, prioritizing the self over society. And you see this because very, uh, it is very rare to find academics who are actively contributing their ideas in simple terms to the public through the media uh, in terms of uh, their contribution to columns, uh, participating in fora, which are outside of the rigid academic um, framework. Uh, there are not many in Malaysia among the Malaysian academics who do this. And the few who do, uh, uh, we know them very well, but I, and I'm hoping I, to see a lot more younger academics, but to date, I think uh, it is still uh, very lacking. The other problem also, which doesn't fall under academic dishonesty, but I thought I would mention it since um, Dr. Rajas' slide um, 
the book uh, about gender inclusivity. Um, many universities in our country organize webinars you know, over the last year and a half. Many of them are mushrooming all over the place. But still, the culprit of manals, completely male panels, come from universities and not civil society organizations. So what, is that, what does this tell you about uh, how much in contact or how connected are the universities with developments on the ground? Uh, this says a lot. Um, which leads me to my last point. We have a narrow vision um, in high, higher education, which, has, which would lead to unsustainable research goals. So what's the way forward, uh, given all these, uh, the dark scenario that I'm painting? Um, we need to be firmly grounded in Western thought. That is definite, but neither blindly critique it nor ape the West. So it goes back to my comment earlier about us not being well grounded in Western thought, um, but yet we decide uh, superficially to critique it or to criticize it uh, because we want to get on the bandwagon of uh, decolonial thinking, but this is not good enough. The second point, we have to be honest and admit that half of our problems, if not more than half, have to do with ourselves, our own society, our politics, our leadership. For example, corruption, unethical, unethical academic culture, etc. In many developing countries, there are serious problems in the administration of universities. We have to stop political interference in the running of universities. We need more leeway in the syllabi that we prepare. There's too much control over certain agencies about what our reading material should be, when our books, um, sources that we use should be published, later than 2017, not before. I mean, these are uh, silly requirements because it is very discipline and uh, subject uh, related, As, and also sources for students to access and the reading material. We have to be a bit more flexible about that. And the last point, many of our countries uh, and in Malaysia exhibit low academic standards, problems of funding, and this reinforces the academic dependency that we have on the West, uh, or rather on uh, societies outside of our region. Um, and through this dependence, there's a form of cultural imperialism as well. Uh, yes, that's about it. I, I hope there will be questions later, um, and I look forward to them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tavunira. Well, I think the session is getting hotter and hotter, and our people are very much alert with the various, first, the approach and knowledge, democracy, the definition, the approaches that Dr. Rajesh has highlighted, for example, from the book. And Dr. Eileen came in and hit the button on disconnect that exists right now with the way you know, the so-called ivory tower researchers and academics are doing things uh, and not connecting enough with the society and dr munira land on the root cause analysis the way i look at it and the root cause began with the very nature of how we started as a nation especially in malaysian context and how that then generate into from colonial to neo-colonial era so you know what i i am now going to open a Q&A session straight away because the ideas are still fresh, fresh with the panelists and the ideas and thoughts that were thrown to us earlier are still fresh from uh, the first session. So we're going to open Q&A right now.